Hey everyone, uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Dr. Salter. I'm faculty here at Hofstra and we're uh, really glad to have everyone today. Um, thanks for coming out to our first uh, in a series of discussions with IO psychologists about uh, practitioner and applied issues. Um, I'm really excited for our first speaker today. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Larry Martinez. Larry is an assistant professor of psychology at uh the portland state university and we're really happy to have you um larry how are you doing today i'm doing well i hope everyone else is doing well too staying yeah. safe <laughs> yeah you know, for sure for sure you know larry um i uh when i was booking this i looked at my calendar and realized that according to my calendar i'm supposed to be flying to psyop today um and so i'm like really bummed that uh, we'll be missing each other, but I'm glad that if I can't see you at PSYOP, I can at least see you here. Yeah, I think I should be at PSYOP right now. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a good, a good proxy, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So, all right, so everyone, for uh, today's session, um, I have a few questions I'm going to ask uh, uh, Larry, um, but as many of you know about me, I think that my questions are probably less interesting than a lot of you all's questions. So uh, for those of you in the audience, if you have questions, Feel free to enter them into the chat box, and Dr. Nolan um, is going to be uh, managing that. And so, he will... real, real, real quick, everybody, just to let you know, I'm PSYKPN. That's who you're going to for chats. Yeah, yeah. So uh, send a message to him, and then um, he will uh, uh, call in people when it's time to incorporate questions in. Also, if you are a um, incoming student in our um, cohort next fall, or you're a prospective student, feel free to send Dr. Nolan a private message. Uh, again, PSYKPN, just introduce yourself so we can kind of know who else in the audience. Um, and then finally, also, again, like I mentioned earlier, but make sure you mute yourself unless you were um, the person asking questions. So great, let's get started. Uh, Larry, can you just start by just uh, introducing yourself and telling us who are you, what's your story? Yeah, sure. So I have a PhD in IO psychology from Rice University. My advisor was Mickey Hebel, if you know about some of her stuff, I'm happy to talk about that. And then uh, after I graduated from Rice, I went and worked at Penn State for four years as an assistant professor in the School of Hospitality Management, which is actually kind of a nice transition for me because at, at Rice, it was very much a uh, training focused on theory and research and uh, more of the academic side of things. And then being in a hospitality department was kind of like being in a, a business school, but uh, only hotels and restaurants and casinos. So that was kind of a challenge trying to think about how my work can be more applied in nature and really start to learn some of the ins and outs of doing more applied work. Um, so I did that for four years and then really wanted to move back to um, psychology. Uh, and I was also getting a little bit not frustrated, but I wanted to expand a little bit beyond just the academic side of things um, and go more into the applied world. So I applied to Portland State. And the thing that's unique about Portland State and what really made me want to come here was that it's a, a good, you know, IO psych program. But the, the motto of the university is let knowledge serve the city which uh, sort of implies that everybody who is at the university is going to be working in some capacity that helps Portland or the city kind of loosely defined like the world, right? So you should be using your teaching and your research to make the world a better place. So actually one of the things that was a defining characteristic for me moving to Portland, um, you know, I had already been on the tenure track for four years. so my department was like, you know, you're pretty good with, you're good with research, you're good with teaching, you're good with service, but if you want to get tenure here, what you need to do is really do more community engaged work um, and find community partnerships and uh, figure out how to leverage the work that you're doing in a way that serves the city. So I was like, yeah, that sounds great. I'm down for that. That's what I want to be doing anyway. And then uh, four years later, I, I'm about a month or two away from hopefully getting a positive tenure uh, letter. So uh, I can talk more about, you know, what those experiences have been like at Portland, but that's kind of like a broad overview in terms of my like professional journey. My, my research is focused on 
uh, prejudice and discrimination and stigma and stereotyping. Um, but you can't really say that to organizational partners. Um, they don't take uh, kindly to you coming in sort of as a scientist and saying, oh, I want to study discrimination in your workplace. And isn't that going to be great? And we're going to, we're going to make things a lot better. They're like, nah, I don't think that's something that I want to do. So um, the way that we focus our work is around inclusion. It's on diversity. It's on uh, making places a better place to work, right? And uh, leveraging diversity and inclusion for a strategic advantage. So that was something that I can talk more about, like trying to learn more of the business speak and make the work that we're doing palatable and, and um, attractive for organizational partners. So that's kind of the, the spiel. Awesome, awesome. By the way, Larry, you may have noticed in the chat, um, one of our students, Azaria, writes, we are. Um, um, <laughs> You, you have, I figured you know. Uh, yeah, a lot of Penn State connections. A lot of Penn State connections. Uh, we are is the slogan at Penn State. So uh, I also went to Penn State, as many of you know, so I can appreciate that. So, so you know, Larry, you mentioned um, the community engaged work that you do at uh, Portland, and that kind of leads to my first question for you. You know, I want to talk about this um, allyship intervention work that you've done. I mean, obviously, a lot of stuff you've done is pretty cool, but um, I want to hear a little bit more about that. So, can you tell me? Just first, actually, what do you mean by allyship and why is allyship important for organizations? Yeah, sure. Um, so the way that we, I got to allyship really started with my work in, in, in prejudice and in stereotyping. So in grad school, I was really interested in the experiences of stigmatized and uh, marginalized employees. So uh, I did a lot of work with uh, people who are transgender, people who are uh, cancer survivors, people who have lots of different sort of marginalized identities. And um, at this point, we've kind of looked at most of the identities you might come that might come to mind. Um, but at the time, what we found was that, uh, in general, being authentic and feeling like you can be yourself and bring like your whole self to work is related to a lot of really positive uh, outcomes. So positive job attitudes, job satisfaction, commitment, authenticity, um, performance, motivation, all of these things that IO psychologists and managers care about seem to go up when people feel like they can be themselves at work. And uh, that's great, but what we wanted to know in particular as psychologists was why, you know? So we can think about sort of intuitively, yeah, it's better if you can be yourself um, because that relieves a lot of stress. But the mechanism that we looked at and that came up over and over and over again consistently, whether it was cancer survivors or transgender or gay and lesbian or mental illness or overweight or whatever, was that coworker reactions and coworker support were really important. So sometimes we modeled it as a mediator. So being more authentic leads to people being more supportive of you. And then that leads to more positive attitudes. And sometimes we modeled it as a moderator that you know, uh, if you're more authentic, then to the extent that other people are uh, more positive, then that's going to be more predictive of these positive outcomes. And what we've, what I kind of came to when I was looking for dissertation topics was, okay, uh, it seems pretty consistently that coworkers are really important. And at that point, we'd been studying, you know, ways that marginalized people can manage their identities uh, in ways to make themselves. Um, reduce discrimination or, or deal with the discrimination that they might experience. And of course, there's a lot of literature around organizational policies that can be put in place in order to make these experiences better. So I went, I remember I went to Google Scholar trying to get my dissertation going. It was like allies and organizations or like what should coworkers do? And nothing came up at the time. Uh, so that was kind of the, the point at which I realized there are a lot of people that want to help and that would like to know what to do, but probably don't know what to do. And we as a field don't really know what people are doing uh, to help each other on sort of an interpersonal uh, grassroots sort of way. So that was sort of the start of it was this, it sort of came out of this other research that showed coworkers over and over again were really important. And then that was the start of, of the allyship work. Um, I think the definition of allyship kind of changes depending on who you're talking about or who you're talking to. There are a couple of us that are doing this work now and we all kind of have slightly different ways of thinking about it. But the, the main thing is that you are uh, in some sort of, 
an ally is typically somebody who has some sort of relative power in some sort of situation. So it might be that they're a majority group member and they're uh, being an ally for somebody who is a minority group, or it might be somebody who uh, isn't a majority group member or is a member of the same group, but happens to have power in that situation. So the idea is that you're leveraging that power in order to help somebody with relatively less power. And um, that should be related to you know, organization, positive organizational outcomes. So um, that's kind of an overview of the general idea with the allyship stuff. Yeah, yeah. So what's From like it, a theoretical standpoint. Yeah, sure, sure. And it's interesting because, you know, this finding this idea of like coworker support as being important for minorities um, uh, is certainly resonates. It makes a lot of sense. What about like the, the people that are going to kind of say, okay, what's the bottom line though? Like, does this impact like, you know, organizations? Does it help organizations make money? You know, like for, I always say like, we're psychologists, so we're helping, uh, we're in the helping field. That should be sec secondary. Other people disagree with me, but what would you say to that argument? Yeah, I think that that's been probably the biggest learning curve for me as a psychologist. And I, I typically kind of describe myself as just like, I'm just a nerd who like does research and I sit in my office and I, you know, I don't, I'm not a business tycoon, right? So um, I think that the way, one of the things that's been nice about being in Portland is that Portland as a community seems to be a lot more open to this type of work than other places that I've been. I remember being in Pennsylvania, trying to do, you know, sort of outreach work and just getting stonewalled by, you know, hotel companies that wouldn't send us participants that didn't want us asking certain questions, um, wouldn't allow us access to, you know, do some of the research to try and make the case, right? So we're trying to do research to establish the business case and show and demonstrate that these things can be beneficial. And it was like, they don't even want to know, right? It's like, you know, fingers in their ears kind of situation. Uh, and at one point, I actually had the idea, I was like, well, if the management isn't working with us, then maybe we can go and uh, work through the unions and get participation through unions. And I ran that sort of casually by my department chair at the time. And he had a very negative reaction and was like, oh, well, you know, our department has a lot of contracts and uh, partnerships with, you know, these big time hotel companies. And if we start having faculty working with the unions, then that might send the wrong message. And I was like, okay, that's not even something that I had considered. And um, it just kind of blew my mind, right? So being in Portland, the way that we've been doing this work uh, initially has been a lot with the nonprofit uh, sector. So I'm uh, on the board for a nonprofit here that does mental health and addiction counseling. And they had us do uh, the allyship training with them. There have been a couple of other associations and nonprofits here that have been just sort of wanting to do this, right? I think that in, in Portland in particular, and this is true in other places um, in the country as well, but they kind of already on board with the notion that diversity and inclusion are good for business. Um, I haven't had to make that argument as much. Um, the, I mean, the good thing is that there is research that shows, you know, that companies that are more diverse tend to perform, uh, outperform companies that aren't when they're matched on, you know, certain uh, characteristics. So there's always that research that you can bring into it, but you know, I think the best, I think that my experience has been that these organizations are kind of already spending money, spending, looking for opportunities to uh, show that they're dedicated to diversity and inclusion. I think that it um, isn't hard to make the case that DNI are a competitive advantage. So that is, um, hasn't been as big of an issue here. Yeah, and I think my advice would be like, especially starting out, look for places that are already looking for that. There are a lot of places that are looking for that and start there and then uh, build off of that. Well, you know, it, it's so interesting because when you think about, you know, working, you know, incorporating Iowa psychology into applied issues is, it comes with its own challenges in general, but as you and I know, like especially when it comes to DNI, um, there's just all these extra hurdles, and, and we can talk about that later. But I I wanted to hear more about you mentioned this allyship intervention that you've done 
um, and that you administer to organizations. Can you talk to me a little bit about this intervention? What all does it entail? What do you do with organizations? Yeah, for sure. So uh, when we started, so I mentioned that I started with the dissertation and what that was, was an experimental study where it was just videos. We created these sort of type of not, we led people to believe that they were actual sort of reenactments of real, you know, uh, workplace uh, incident reports. But uh, we got actors to uh, engage in this little vignette play. Uh, and the beginning was always the same. There were two people in a uh, uh, sort of a conference room. One of them said something, you know, kind of homophobic. The other one confronts him and says one of many different sort of confrontation styles, right? So uh, that was the first sort of thing that we, that I wanted to look at was, okay, if somebody says something sort of offensive, what do you do, you know, from a very practical sort of sense? Like, what's the best way of responding? So that was the idea. We tried eight different response styles and, um, found that it was basically, it was this weird combination of being very direct with the person. So like you said this, you sound homophobic, you should change as opposed to a more indirect, like we should all kind of be mindful of the things that we say. Um, so a, a very direct sort of confrontation, but also in a calm way, right? So one of the other dimensions was being very hostile and like sort of yelling and cursing and like getting worked up that didn't work. Um, but if you were calm, but also direct, that seemed to produce the, the best outcomes in terms of, uh, you know, a lack of backlash for the confronter, um, increased uh, perceptions that the perpetrator had done something wrong, right? So even though they'd done the same thing in all situations, the way that they were confronted changed the perception of the interaction. Um, so we took that and then sort of took a step back and thought, okay, well, that's good, but we, if we really want to know about allyship, then let's just ask people, what does this look like? You know, at the time, we had no idea what allyship looked like in workplace sort of context. So we got a bunch of people who uh, identified as allies. We got a bunch of people who were uh, uh, from a stigmatized group, and we just asked them, you know, about their allyship experiences in these uh, focus groups. So we did that. We did a couple of other, you know, studies. We did some experiments. We did more surveys. And... Um, over time, we came to develop this model that is based uh, loosely around the, um, if you're familiar with social psychology, the confronting prejudice responses model, which is itself based on the like bystander intervention work. So this idea that there are sometimes people who need help that might be in emergency situations. And, you know, the, the big takeaway from that research is that as you get more people involved in the scenario, it's less likely that each one person will respond and will help. So it's this diffusion of responsibility idea. But, uh, which wasn't really the aspect that we were looking in, but what we were trying to do was take this cognitive aspect, right? There are these sort of mental hurdles that people have to get through, you know, identify that it's a problem, identify that you're the one that's responsible for addressing it, identify what kind of solution you're gonna have, and you have to kind of be able to do all of those things sequentially, cognitively, before you actually engage in a response, before you actually confront, right? So we use that model and really sort of dug into that. And uh, with the focus groups also, ask people, you know, what sort of behaviors have you engaged in? Have they been successful? Have they been not been successful? And specifically, what are some cases tell us about instances where you thought you should have done something, but you didn't? or you did something and it was the wrong thing, right? So we're trying to identify these barriers. So one, we wanted to know what are people actually doing? And then we wanted to see what are, what are the things that are keeping people from doing those things? So then in the training, we um, sort of systematically thought about each of those cognitive barriers that might keep people from engaging in, um, in an allyship type of behavior and then just knocking them down, right? So one barrier is, I don't know exactly what to say. I don't have a script in place. I don't have experience with this. Um, and I'm afraid that if I say the wrong thing, then I might make things worse or, you know, uh, be somebody who sort of speaks on behalf of people and sort of takes over the conversation, right? So there's a lot of nuance to this, but um, one of the things that we do in the training is just educate people about allyship in general, right? So we tell people you're not gonna get it right all the time, but doing something is better than doing nothing. We tell people that um, uh, we show them different response styles. So we've generated 
lots of different ways beyond just confrontation in a direct and, and a calm sort of way. Um, we have developed other ways of responding. So like asking a question or invoking like social norms, right? Like, oh, you know, I don't know if other people would agree with you. And, you know, that might make other people think that you're racist, you know, like so sort of using social psychology in order to um, change people's perceptions a little bit. Um, so that's a big part of it. We train people on these different things, then we show them using uh, role modeling. So we're bringing in sort of the classic Bandura, you know, social learning sort of stuff. Um, we show people how it can work in, or in organizational context using these uh, videos. And then um, one of the big things that we saw as a barrier is not having the confidence and uh, the script, like I was saying before. So um, people feel like they should do something and they know what they should do, but then they feel like, oh, I, I don't wanna do it. So we have them, also engage in uh, role-playing scenarios. So we have people pair up together and we give them um, sort of racist or homophobic things to say to one another and then the other person has to generate a response, right? And the idea is that it's an awkward situation. They have to come up with a solution on the fly. We just sort of gave them ideas about how to do it, but uh, we're breaking down those behavioral and cognitive barriers that would say like, okay, I've never done this before and getting that sort of out of their system so that uh, theoretically when they experience that sort of out in the wild, then they'll be more confident and, and feeling like, okay, well, I have done this before. It was a contrived situation, but I, you know, I have a little bit more confidence in, in, in this. So that's a big part of it. I think uh, when we're doing this with organizations that exist, it's nice to have them all in the same place because it sort of also sets the social norm and the expectation, right? So we're all sort of doing this together and there's a shared knowledge base of what um, the expectation is moving forward. And that for me, I think is really key. So I, you know, I'm an IO psychologist, but I always sort of consider myself to be like an applied social psychologist that is now workplace only and for a time was only hotels, but that's fine. And, um, you know, I think that organizational policies are necessary. I think that um, all of these things are good, but at the end of the day, my one of the things that I think is missing that I think is really powerful is this notion that, you know, human beings are social creatures. We like uh, being around people. We uh, like being accepted in groups and we don't like being ostracized and being left out of groups. So if we can set a social norm within an organizational context that establishes rules of engagement that include, you know, being nice to one another and not being discriminatory, um, then I think that's a really powerful motivator, right? So if you like think about, if you're like a super racist person and then you join a super not racist organization and then you get told over and over again, hey, you gotta cut that out, you're probably gonna cut it out or you're gonna leave, right? So it's really trying to um, use individual interactions and interpersonal relationships to form sort of a culture that I think is going to be potentially more powerful than having some policy in place that establishes that, right? And the policies, again, are necessary, but I, I think that's where there's a big disconnect is that organizations put policies in place and then they expect people to just be better without teaching them concrete specific behaviors on how to engage in with one another and um, without creating this sort of shared cultural norm about how this is supposed to go and what's allowed and what's not allowed. So we're taking a much more um, grassroots approach to it. Yeah, and I, I think that's the thing is that like, as IO psychologists, we know that like culture change is so much more well, I don't know if I should say so much more important, but equally important, very important in, in, in addition to organizational policies and whatnot. But we also kind of know that organizational change is so much harder to do. And therefore we're like, oh, well, we'll start with the low hanging fruit of just like make a policy, don't be racist. And it's like, okay, well, great, you know, but then don't forget that other piece as well, you know? Yeah. So when you've delivered these uh, uh, trainings to organizations, like what are the reactions you typically get from the participants? Um, and I guess also from the organizations, like how do people respond? So um, we're kind of playing to certain audiences, right? So the nonprofit sector, nonprofit employees, right? They're like do-gooders uh, in general. They are 
uh, in it to help people and to try and make the world a better place. So it's kind of it's kind of an easy audience, right? Um, the the first organization that we did was the mental health and addiction counseling um, organization. We did it with, there were about 580 people at once uh, in a big ballroom in this hotel. And um, it was interesting because we did, you know, pre and post measurements of, you know, people's perceptions about allyship and do they consider themselves to be allies. And the scores on those uh, pre measures were really high. It was like 5.8 out of seven, right? So people really, they were coming into the training thinking, I am already a good ally, right? Uh, so that is one aspect that I think is kind of um, difficult to overcome, right? Especially in Portland, like the Portland sort of culture is good because people are sort of on board with diversity, but they also think that they know it all already. Um, and the the written responses and some of the you know feedback that we've gotten at that training and some of the other ones that we've done have been really positive. So I think the things that stand out for us and that give us sort of a competitive advantage in terms of um, marketing this is that we are really strongly heavily research based or really strongly theory based. It's everything is coming from like a scientific standpoint. We have data that uh, validate you know these sort of measures every time that we have done the training, we've collected data that show at least pre-post uh, differences. And, and even in that first case where they started out really high, at the end of the training, they were higher, a little bit higher. They didn't have much uh, room to go, but it was a statistically significant difference. So that's good. Um, uh, they like that aspect of it uh, that I think that we provide that other you know trainers may not have. I think that they also really appreciated the fact that we were giving concrete behavioral things, right? So people have done diversity trainings before. We're very careful not to call it a diversity training because people hate that. Um, we call it an ally skill building workshop. And I think people like the idea of being allies. They like the idea of learning new skills. They don't like the idea of being preached to about diversity. And uh, the implication I think is that if you go to a diversity training, it's because you need to. And if you need to, it's because you're racist and nobody identifies as being racist. So you're already starting from a point that people are kind of defensive, right? So we've worked around that. Uh, and uh, like I was saying, they, they really like the behavioral aspect. So a lot of the written comments were things like, I like the fact that this is concrete. I like the fact that this is something that I can apply. Um, it's not just a theoretical sort of like, this is bias and everybody has bias and we may not even be conscious of our biases. So we need to, you know, like that gets tiresome and people don't like that. So I think that we've been uh, really strategic in terms of focusing on like, okay, here's what might happen and here's what you do and we're going to practice. Yeah. It, it's interesting that you say that um, you find that most people are already saying that they are very positive towards diversity issues and they're already identifying as allies and whatnot. I did a study a couple years ago where um, we, one of the questions, like the demographic questions was, do you identify as an ally? And of the hundreds of people that we did in our study, I think all but one said, yes, I'm an ally. And it's like, uh, okay, well then, you know, what do you mean by that? And, you know, is it just kind of like, because it's not really cool or politically correct these days to say like, no, I'm not, you know? Um, but it is definitely something we, I, I think a lot about. Um, yeah, it absolutely. I've done that kind of stuff before too and found the same stuff. And I have a lot of, ideas about that, which are probably beyond the scope of this, but. Yes, yes, yes. Um, it's interesting you said this. You said that the, the one you did was 580 people in a ballroom. Is that right? So that's yeah. interesting. So, you know, I suspect that like when you were working with organizations, you might not have a lot of flexibility as to like the size or the venue or the whatnot, but do you have preferences or thoughts when you're doing this type of work with organizations, like in the ideal world, what would you like the size of the, your sessions to be and the composition and whatnot? Yeah, so I'm, it's interesting because my, my take on this, I kind of arrived at the training aspect of it through the stigma stuff, right? So uh, in grad school, I didn't, I wasn't trained in training, for instance. Um, I kind of came to the training. So I've been learning a lot from colleagues of mine that were trained in training. And um, um, one, some, a lot of the things that we've been uh, talking about and learning that I've learned from them 
is that you want smaller sessions. So um, in terms of timing, the ideal is about three hours. Um, people can't sustain much longer than that at a time. Organizations don't like committing more time than that typically. Um, and the best situation is smaller groups. So about 20 would probably be the ideal maximum. About 10 is the ideal minimum somewhere in there. Um, and that, uh, especially for this training, gives people a lot of time for discussion. You know, there's a lot of controversial sort of issues we touch on. Um, we don't talk about, you know, specific identities, but in the scenarios, we do include things like gender identity and transgender and uh, weight discrimination, you know, things that people don't typically think about when they think about diversity and inclusion. So, um, and how to respond to those types of things. So that typically generates a lot of conversation. It generates a lot of, oh, well, I had this happen to me and I said this, and would this be a good response? You know, so that I think is really valuable in the training. And when we did the 580, you know, the, we did have a session of that where people kind of, you know, passed a microphone around, but ideally it would be smaller sessions so that you can get a, a more intimate sort of experience. And I think people are, more willing to be honest and forthright, especially with these sort of sensitive issues in the smaller groups. Absolutely. Um, can you tell me about the types of challenges that you face, like when you uh, deliver these uh, interventions, when you just kind of generally do this type of work? What type of challenges do you uh, face? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges has been getting organizations on board. So the nonprofits have been great. Nonprofits are fairly easy to get into. Um, but we've been trying to do more uh, for-profit organizations. So I've talked with um, some law offices. I've talked with uh, energy companies here locally uh, and, and not locally. I've talked with some uh, Department of Defense branches. And they never, they haven't quite gotten there yet in terms of um, getting to like a contract, right? Or getting to a training. So I, I think, and I think a lot of that is my own failing, quite honestly. So like I said, I'm not a business tycoon. I don't have an MBA. I don't really understand things like marketing or um, like uh, financials or, you know, I think in order to do this well uh, as like a business, I would need to probably quit my job at Portland State and then probably get a business degree and then go and start doing this, you know? So I've been doing it mostly from a scientific aspect. Um, and um, that's been a big challenge for me is not being able to get to a place where an organization is like, okay, let's do a training for $50,000 or for $100,000 or something like that, right? Um, and even the question, I think where I, I get um, tripped up is, you know, people are on board, they like the idea, allyship is great. And then they're like, okay, well, how much does it cost? And then I'm always like, I don't know how, you know, and I'm kind of like, I have a job, so it's not that important to me. I would like to make money because money is great. Um, and that's where I, I kind of start to falter, right? It's like, well, it depends. You know, the scientific aspect or the scientific answer to most questions is it depends. So, you know, it depends on how many people do you want to do? Do you want to do it over a span of several weeks? Do you want to do it all in one day? Do you want to do everyone at once? Do you want to have small groups? Do you want to do leadership first and then roll it out to the rest of the organization? Do you want us to cover, you know, how many do you want us to add modules? Do you want us to add sexual harassment to it? Do you want us to add, you know, leadership training to this? You know, so I think that that complexity scares people off. I think that um, my, my desire to try and make it as customizable to the organization as possible makes them feel like I don't know what I'm doing, right? <laughs> and from the business aspect, they're probably right, right? So I probably need like somebody to come in and be like, okay, here's your thing. And we're going to offer package A and package A includes this and this, and it costs this much. And then package B costs this and this, and it includes that. But then there's option C and these are the three options and you pick one and then that's what it is, right? Just keep it simple. And that I think is, a, is something that 
is probably the next step for me in terms of if I wanted to grow this like as a business, right? So I started a consulting firm a few years ago and I've done a couple of projects through that. Um, not the allyship training yet. And I can talk about some of those other stuff, those other aspects too. But um, I think that's been a big barrier for me is not feeling like I have the knowledge or the time to start a business, right? That would be perceived as legitimate from other businesses, you know? So that, that's been a big barrier for me. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think that's probably a commentary on our field of biopsychology that like, we get trained in all of this like really great like best practices according to scientific research and whatnot um but perhaps some of us at least for me and it sounds like you as well aren't necessarily trained on kind of as heavily on the the business aspect of kind of like finances and market you know kind of all the extra stuff that kind of goes with it you know i know there's a lot of cool research that's being done on uh communicating scientific data and information to non-scientists management um, so that's like one part of it, but there's, it's, it's so much more. And I, I, I hear you. Yeah. I think that's the first part of it is like learning how to do the business speak aspect, you know, and like these like terms that, occur, uh, uh, that uh, exist in the business world that we just don't, aren't exposed to. Um, but then the other aspect is just like, I remember one of my, um, I guess employees, right? And one of my students was like, oh, are you gonna do 1099s for people? And I was like, I have no idea what that means. It's like, I don't even know how to start that process, you know? So stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember when I was in grad school being told by like upper years and alumni who were doing practice work, like just subscribe to like Fortune Magazine, Money Magazine, just to learn that lingo and the jargon that you're talking about. It's just like a, a basic first step, you know? Yeah, I think, I think that's, a, I should probably do that. That's a good, that's good advice. <laughs> um, what I've been doing is trying to uh, partner and network with other people who do have that mindset, right? So um, I have a colleague who graduated from Colorado State who did her dissertation on allyship also, and she decided to go start her own consulting company doing diversity training. And I had a call with her uh, just a few days ago talking about you know, she wants to leverage the training that we put together from a scientific perspective. That's a business word, right? Leverage and <laughs> synthesis. And <laughs> um, but uh, so she wants to leverage the work that we've been doing and then um, she'll become like sort of the business arm, right? And like getting, generating business ideally. Um, and I've had, I have another colleague who is a, a training expert. Um, Y'all might know Wendy Bedwell. We've had conversations about, um, she does a lot of training like with, with Department of Defense and NASA and all of this. And she's now starting her own sort of firm and was, we've been talking about uh, rolling the allyship training into her sort of suite of packages that she could offer. Um, hey, and then, Larry, hey, yeah. Sorry, yeah, just really quick. Um, uh, one of the, the uh, you know, guests today, one of the, the, the audience members, wanted to recommend to you that they know that Hofstra has a program like at our school that actually does stuff to help out small support small businesses and was wondering if you'd um, looked into going through your university at all to try to see if they have any programs like that that could maybe merge that area of you doing the scientific research with the support from the business side uh, through the university at all. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh... I had some more good advice. So I feel like I'm learning more from this than y'all are. <laughs> oh, I doubt that. But, but um, yeah, that's a good idea. I think that at this point, my main barrier has been time, right? So I've been eight years on the 10 year clock trying to pub, you know, punch out research, trying to network. And that's okay. So that's another thing that's really important is I didn't appreciate when I took this job and I like devoted myself to applied work how much time and effort it takes to just meet people and go to events and introduce yourself and have your card on you and like every opportunity becomes like oh well I'm so and so and I do this training and you know who are you and do you have an organization and do you want you know like it becomes kind of like all-encompassing and it it's a lot of work and it's a lot of time that in particular, like for tenure case sort of situations, isn't documented, right? So there was nowhere in my tenure dossier that was like, I attended a hundred meet and greets and I schmoozed 300 hours and made, you know, some, so many connections, you know, and 
you have to do a lot of that in order to get to the one thing that uh, leads to a contract or a data collection sort of opportunity. So that's an important part. But now that I should, you know, right, knock on wood, uh, have tenure starting next year, I'm hoping to be able to have more time to slow down and, and, and learn more, right? So it's interesting that like after tenure, I can learn more about business stuff. Yeah, so that's gonna be a good opportunity, hopefully. Yeah, and, and again, it's just this whole other side to our field and to, that there's so much more to learn than just kind of, you know, what, what are the theories, what do the textbooks say about different stuff? So it's, it's very interesting. Um, you talked a little bit about the challenges that you face with like, you know, getting organizations um, on board with this topic and also just kind of the challenges of like the business side of these things. What about kind of on the individual participant level? Like, do you encounter challenges like certain topics are really difficult for people to kind of digest or, or they push back or within the sessions, do you see kind of challenges on the individual participant level? Yeah, there can be. Um... You know, it's, it's, I think that teaching kind of prepares you for that a little bit. You know, you never quite know what people are going to say in a classroom environment and you have to kind of roll with the punches. But, um, you know, we've had some situations where people have alternative ideas about how, you know, things should work. A lot of, you know, uh, one of the criticisms to the trainings that we've had, that we've done so far have been like, well, I don't feel comfortable doing direct calm confrontations, you know, and that's good feedback. So we thought, okay, let's come up with more strategies. Of course, there are different ways that may or may not be better, you know, scientifically. Um, we may not be able to show that it's like P less than 0.05 better than this other thing. But if you're more comfortable doing that, then practically that's probably better than not doing anything, you know, so uh, trying to figure out and, and make it more customizable to individuals, people's comfort levels and perspectives. Um, one of the things that, we, uh, that we've sort of identified as part of our allyship research is this notion that allyship is not really like a binary, right? You're not like an ally or you're not, you're just like learning always. There's a developmental process associated with sort of becoming an ally and, and uh, generating more skills. So I think that that's a big uh, part of it. At the individual level too, one of the things that we've seen which we saw in the focus groups too, but frequently people don't know how to navigate this sort of tightrope between I want to be helpful, but I don't want to be patronizing, right? So particularly people who have majority identities um, that have, you know, historical privilege, they may not feel comfortable, you know, speaking up sort of on behalf of marginalized people. And that is a really tough thing because, um, you know, also in the focus groups, people said, you know, what I really need is somebody to be an advocate for me when I'm not around. Uh, or, you know, if somebody says something and there's nobody else in the room to say something, that's when I need somebody to say something, right? And that's a difficult, a difficult thing to know, right? Whether you are being helpful and, you know, we're, we're using this term sort of consensual allyship. Thomas Asso came up with that, I think, or, um, but, um, I think that's a really great way of, of coming about it, right? You're an ally only to the extent that people want you to be an ally. And as far as the developmental process, what we've seen in the literature is that when people sort of decide to become allies, there's a, a certain sort of sequence of, of phases that people go through. And one of the phases is this like excitement of like, okay, I've, I've, I wanna be an ally and I've now done a lot of learning and maybe I've gone to a training and now I'm gonna go be an ally everywhere. And that is where you run the risk of um, acting in these patronizing sort of ways, right? So it's this delicate sort of way of knowing. And the thing that's ironic about the whole situation is that if you're a majority type person who's speaking up for other people, then you're trying to help reduce inequalities. But what you're actually doing is establishing and legitimizing these power differentials, right? I'm the savior that has power and you're the person who needs saved. And by me saving you, I'm actually like ironically reinforcing the notion that you are lower, right? So that's a tough thing to get people's minds around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, um, you've talked a little bit about some kind of general challenges with working with organizations on DNI issues. Like, you know, you mentioned like, don't say the word diversity, say inclusion. Um, uh, organizations put their fingers in their ears because they don't want to know these things. What other just kind of general challenges, not necessarily even for allyship, but just for working with organizations on diversity and inclusion issues, what other challenges have you encountered? Yeah, I think it is, I think it's really important to keep in mind like what their bottom line is, you know? So one of the things that I've experienced too is a lot of these conversations have to go through multiple levels. So like SIOP last year, speaking of SIOP, SIOP last year was the first time that we presented the results of our allyship training, the pre-post sort of preliminary sort of stuff, um, which was sort of nice because it was in an, a, a symposium it was all about allyship and I think the other papers were either theoretical or qualitative and we had actual you know pre-post training data so after that you know that led to a lot of conversations with people who were at PSYOP saying you know let's connect let's talk about you doing your allyship training in our organization so we spent a lot of months negotiating with those people and then those people were always on board and then it was they had to get buy-in from their managers, from the higher-ups, from the lawyers, whatever. And it was sort of at that level that there was a disconnect, right? It's not, um, I think that there were some issues with like, the excuse that I always get is like, it's a financial thing, right? So we don't have our budget for next year until such and such time. And then I wait until such and such time, like, hey, how about this? Oh yeah, we want to do it. And then like, and then like kind of, silence right like I get kind of ghosted a lot <laughs> um, which is weird and I think what happens is that these people who are maybe HR um, you know professionals uh, maybe DNI professionals um, want to do it and then there's some I don't know what that sort of disconnect internally on their end is so um, if anybody has advice about that that would be a cool thing that I would be interested in knowing but um, that's hey, Larry, been a big challenge, yeah. Larry, just, we have a, a question. I'm going to turn it over to, to Nicole. Nicole has a question for you about some of the, the evaluation you do. Nicole, do you want to unmute yourself? There you sure, go. yeah. Um, Dr. Martinez, I was just wondering, um, with your training, when you go into, uh, you know, organizations, um, how, how do you kind of show that the training has been successful? What, what kind of measures do you use or what kind of outcomes are you looking for? Because... I'm trying to wrap my head around how this actually manifests and how, how you can prove that what you did is, you know, has paid off and, you know, to, to different degrees. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, it's been sort of an evolving process. Um, we have the data from the focus groups that show, you know, that sort of thing. We have, I've been drawing a lot of the data from before that shows authenticity is good. Coworker support is really important. And it leads to things like job satisfaction and commitment and fit and you know all of these sort of things. So we have that sort of as a backdrop and I go over that in the training to try and establish like why it's important um, and why allies in particular are important. I also bring in some like historical examples about allies you know, being really important for these social movements that you know, don't seem to get traction until majority group members get involved. Um, so that's part of it, but that's all theoretical, right? We have now at this point um, four different instances of training, just pre-post. And in every time that we've done the training, we've found pre-post differences. So people feel more empowered. They feel more confident after the training than before, which is kind of like a baseline. We need that at least, you know, so it's not very strong evidence, but it's at least not bad. Um, and it's in the right direction what the ideal situation would be, would be to be able to show return on investment, right? So we tried to get with the, the first organization, we tried to get some sort of a metric related to uh, maybe turnover or performance or something like that. And there were just a lot of other things that were happening in the organization that prevented us from being able to say that it was the training, right? They were going through this entire restructure that had like a couple million dollars worth of federal money coming in that was happening at the same time as the training. So there's no way we could have said like, oh, it's not because of this huge restructure, you know? So that's been kind of an issue. Um, the way to, so the other thing that we've done is we did the first four trainings in 2018 and we've been spending the last um, year or so 
re redoing the training. So we've been using the data to uh, shorten the measures. We've now got uh, validation studies that show that the measures are actually measuring the things that they're supposed to measure. We have uh, the pre-post data. We have uh, the scripts that have been changed. We have data for each scenario that shows how uh, believable and how realistic and how effective they are. Each script is in generating um, responses. So we have a lot of data about the training now as it was before. And we can say that the new training is completely uh, data driven um, as opposed to just theoretically sort of derived, which is nice. And um, it's going to get a lot better because the ideal situation would be to have um, the uh, a random, what's called a randomized control trial. So you have an organization that has uh, members in them that um, is a real organization where they actually work together long term. We have some sort of a natural setting where there are two groups, ideally, um, that we can say this group that works together gets this training and they're the same as this group, except they get the training. And then we measure that for six months. Um, we have a, a plan, you know, pre post, one month, three month six month, nine month, 12 month um, uh, to see what the long-term effects are. And then uh, at the end of that, the other group would get trained so we could control for um, those types of effects and then see uh, one, everybody gets the training and we can see you know, the time lag sort of differences uh, longitudinally. So that would be ideal and also having access to things like you know, actual performance data. So like return on investment data. So not just like employee data, but like ROI data. Um, and that is going to be a big challenge. That's been the, the, the next step for this now that we have the training sort of revised. And I'm really happy to be able to say that I just a few weeks ago received funding from the National Science Foundation um, through a career award to do that. Um, uh, the, the research aspect is going to be able is going to be uh, able to provide funding to actually pay participants in organizations to do the training for scientific purposes, which sounds backwards because normally, you know, organizations pay people to have their employees trained, but we were able to get funding to say, okay, you don't have to pay us, just give us access and we will, you know, do the training and actually pay you uh, to do the training or the individual employees, right, for their time. And uh, the other aspect of that is that we have identified an organizational partner that actually allows us to not only have the two groups, but uh, we wrote into the grant to be able to convert the in-person training to an online portion. And then this organization also has two remote locations that we can do um, the online portion with them and then do the, remote, the uh, randomized control trial with them. So we can also test the relative impact of the online versus the in-person version. So I think that the online version is going to be really great because, you know, then we can disseminate it a lot more widely. And the best thing is that we're going to then have the type of data that we would need in order to establish whether or not there is return on investment, right? And I think that that's one of the things that's been intuitively appealing for a lot of the organizations. You know, I can say, this isn't my full-time job. I have a job. I'm a nerd. I'm a scientist. I really just care. I really actually care about whether this works and I'm willing to work with you um, to make sure that it works. I'm not just going to do my training and then take the money and then like go do my training somewhere else. Right. So it is more of a partnership. I, I do have uh, an implicit sort of motivation to show that this works. You know, it's, I've spent a lot of time <laughs> working on this, hopefully showing that it works and to, to make people's lives better. So uh, I think not having the financial incentive is 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 good in this scenario. So, Larry, but, I, I got yeah. another question for me for from another Nicole that's going to be piggybacking on exactly what you were just talking about. I think so. Uh, Nicole, do you want to ask Larry your question? Yeah. So uh, similar to what you were kind of talking about, thinking about the world today and how everyone has shifted to fully virtual because of COVID-19 and everything going on. I had like one of two kind of, so my first question is, how do you think training is gonna kind of shift and your methods will shift due to it? And then also, how do you think that allyship might, allyship might also shift as well? So how you can be an ally being in this virtual world now? Yeah, I think that's, those are great questions. Um, 
I'm, I'm really lucky in that one of my colleagues and collaborators on this allyship project is, his name is Jason Randall. He's at um, SUNY Albany. And he's actually, his area of research is on e-learning. So he develops um, best practices on uh, doing these trainings online and virtually. And he has a lot of uh, expertise on like mindfulness and mind wandering in particular and how mind wandering is bad for training and attention and training and learning principles and, and specifically in an online environment. So I think that uh, I'm excited to move more into that space. I uh, don't have a lot of experience with that yet, um, but I think that it's gonna be really easy to convert a lot of the modules and, and the videos and stuff and uh, scenarios into an online environment. And we haven't started with that yet, but I'm excited to get going. And in terms of allyship in a virtual world, that's, is, that's probably the million dollar question right now, right? And I don't, I think, you know, theoretically, it's gonna be doing a lot of the same things that we should be doing anyway, you know? And that's, at the end of the day, that's really what we're trying to get with the ally training, you know? So we approach it not from a, the standpoint of like a diversity training necessarily, you know, one of the things that we do as part of the exercises is um, a perspective taking exercise and uh, sort of a day in the life. So we try and get people to internalize this experience a little bit better so that it's not just for minorities, right? Um, it's for everybody. So we ask people, Think about a time when you may have uh, been in a situation when you felt like you could have used an ally, that you wish somebody had been there for you, you know, and what would it feel like, what did it feel like when they were there for you? And what did it feel like when they weren't there for you? And uh, describe a situation when you felt like you could have been there for somebody else, you know, so it's very broad and very general and it's just sort of like being a good person <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, and those are the ki kinds of behaviors that I think we are trying to establish. So. I think it's just really hitting on, you know, checking on people, making sure people are okay, being kind to one another, putting yourself in other people's shoes, empathizing. And then um, that's where I think there's a lot of opportunities in like a virtual environment. And uh, Katina Sawyer, I've been thinking this for a while and I think Katina's gotten uh, a leg up on this type of work, but I think that mindfulness is really, really gonna be key moving forward in this type of work, right? Because People, because people have this negative reaction to diversity training, I think that using mindfulness as sort of a workaround is a way of getting people more um, on board with the idea of, you know, just being kind to one another. Awesome. Well, uh, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So if people have to jump off, that's fine. But Larry, do you have time for one last question? Uh, can you tell me, so what advice do you have for students that are interested in getting involved with DNI applied work? Like, students, there's a lot of students in the room right now. You know, I graduate, I want to do DNI. Like, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I think that in, in DNI work, like in organizational context, right? Yeah. yeah. So I think that one of the things that I've learned is the value of, of networking, right? Uh, and this is true. So one of the things that's really uh, easy to keep in mind is like, you know, just sort of show up, you know, you never quite know what's going to happen if you show up. Um, but you do know what's gonna happen if you don't show up, you know, so I've, I've been really amazed over the last couple of years. There have been a lot of events that happen like 6.30 at night on a Thursday after I've been teaching all day and it's raining and I don't want to go and and I'll go and then it's like oh I met this incredible person and then that person that led to another thing and then that person introduced me to another person um, I had that situation happen there was this event that I didn't want to go to for this organization that I'm on the board for um, but I went and I met somebody who was creating this community of practice for DNI in Portland, got me involved with that, um, had me come as a guest speaker to talk to that group. That led to more connections among those people, which led to more connections. And that's how, you know, I became a board member because I gave a talk at this, you know, sort of random thing that I didn't think anybody was going to be at, but somebody saw that and then that turned into a board membership. Um, so I think that's a really easy kind of thing to do is just kind of show up even when you don't want to go and, you know, you make yourself open and available for 
opportunities, you know, and talk to people and not everybody you talk to is going to be useful, which it sounds really cruel to say, but, um, you know, it's, I think networking is a skill that we don't foster enough in IO psych. Um, and it's too bad, right? Cause PSYOP is a really good, that's kind of like the best place to like send grad students, like, no, go talk to this person and, you know, go see that it's not that big of a deal. Um, so I think that would be, you know, that's kind of like a weird answer, but honestly, I think that that was a big thing that I was missing and didn't appreciate was just, you know, meet people and, and figure out how to meet people efficiently and to uh, follow up with people. Cause I think that the, having those networks is the easiest and fastest way to get ahead. And another example, speaking of PSYOP, I think that one of the best things that I did as a grad student was join the PSYOP LGBT committee as a student, you know, and it was just an opportunity to meet other IO psychologists that were from other universities. And um, that's where I met Dr. Salter and here we all are today, right? So it was just, you know, just show up and go do some stuff. You know, I think that's an easy, an easy thing that can have big benefits that you can't anticipate. Well, well, speaking of networking, Larry, um, if students want to contact you uh, after this session to find out more about your work, uh, how can they uh, get a hold of you? Yeah, absolutely. So my email is pretty easy. It's uh, just larry.martinez at uh, pdx.edu. Um, and you can, you know, I'm sure y'all can send that out. I'm easy to find if you Google Larry Martinez, Portland State. Uh, my email's on there. Definitely send me an email and uh, we can go from there. Awesome. Well, I'm happy to talk. I know everybody sort of says like, oh yeah, contact me, but like genuinely actually do if you have questions. This is a real thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this, uh, this hour, Larry. Um, I, I certainly felt like I learned a lot. Um, um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This is my first sort of virtual talk and I haven't, I'm not teaching right now, so I don't have students. So this has been nice. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're in a strange world, the, a strange virtual world these days. So it's nice to have connections. So. Yeah, for sure. Okay, everyone. Thank you all for attending. Um, uh, uh, hope you have a nice day and we hope to see you soon. Bye, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Take care.